We are here with Ron Edgar, who will speak of the role of radical skepticism in madness and recovery. Ron is a licensed clinical social worker who draws upon his own personal and family experiences of psychosis and experience as a therapist to develop innovative and humanistic approaches. He chairs the education committee for ISPS US. Thank you for being here and thank you, Ron. Yeah, thanks, Nays, for that introduction. So um, I'm gonna jump right in with a, a question that maybe we could all ask ourselves. You know, even when we have a strong sense that we know certain things and we're in touch with reality, how do we really know that what we think we know is true? You know, how do we know that it couldn't all come crashing down on us? Like if we found out we were caught up in a vast web of deception or if we started waking up from something like a complex dream. You know, we, we might think we have a method of knowing that that isn't possible or at least extremely unlikely. But how do we know that our method of knowing things and our method of knowing what's likely and unlikely is something we can truly rely on? How do we know our sanity is something we can truly rely on? Um, interestingly, it turns out that all of our justifications of our methods of knowing rely on a certain circularity. Um, you know, if we ask ourselves, what's a good method of knowing so that we know we're going to come up with correct information, we might think, well, a method that leads to information which is accurate, right? But, but how can we determine what's accurate information if we don't have a trustworthy way of knowing that we can use to arrive at such information? Um, in normal times, we don't worry about all that too much. We just trust a kind of circular information process as shown in the slide. You know, we have methods of going about knowing things that lead to information, which mostly matches what we already think we know is true. And that confirms for us that our method of knowing is mostly sound and accurate. Um, and then another thing we might do is check information we get from one source with information from another source. You know, that means something like, well, if one voice tells us that something is true, maybe we can check with the other voices and see if they agree. And then we know we're on the right track. Now, of course, you might see the flaw in that. Like, you know, what if all the voices we hear are just making stuff up? And that could be true whether we're talking about um, you know, the voices we hear in our minds or the voices of our friends or the voices of the commentators on our favorite social media bubble uh, or, or even our senses. Um, but this brings up the question, you know, what can happen if we lose faith in that circle of our usual mind and our usual way of making up our mind? I'm especially going to want to look at what happens when we lose faith in a big way. Um, for example, what if that loss of faith is extreme to the point we can no longer believe any of the following? You know, what if we can no longer believe our senses? You know, we could be hallucinating or dreaming. What if we can't trust our memories? You know, they could be made up. What if we can't trust any communication from others? You know, what if it starts seeming like others might only be fantasies or they might be liars or they might be demons sent to mislead us? You know, checking in with others might be like checking in with other characters in a dream to see if the other characters in the dream are real or not. Can you really rely on it? You know, our thoughts. What if all our thoughts are wrong? Our values and emotions. You know, what if they're all misguided? If we can't trust any of that stuff, we end up kind of like tumbling in a sort of void or a deep mystery. Um, both an assured sense of ourself and assured sense of the world could be gone. It's hard to conceive of because to get there, we have to question all of our conceptions. And we commonly avoid thinking that way or even thinking of that possibility. A guy named Paul Moyer described this by saying that a person experiencing schizophrenia fascinates us because he confronts us with the ultimate groundlessness of any process of meaning. We, we have to call them sick and refuse to listen to them else we might have to face this groundlessness ourselves. But, but what I'm hoping we can do today in this talk is to face that groundlessness together and consider questions like, what if what we usually believe is, is completely wrong? For example, on, on what basis um, 
can we be sure that one day we won't wake up and find out that we aren't really human beings at all? You know, instead, what if we woke up and found we're really some other kind of creature or, or an entity beyond what we've ever imagined? Um, so that's a, a very radical question. But before I dive really deep into it, I want to notice that, that questioning our sense of reality and our methods of knowing also has less radical versions. And they happen on a continuum. And even in everyday life, we, we allow some questioning of what's in our mind and some questioning of our ideas about reality around the edges. Um, so let's talk some about what might cause a shift from something like everyday question to something more like radical skepticism that I'm going to be talking about. And I think one source of the escalation of skepticism can, can be the experience of trauma, which can increase skepticism in a number of ways. Now, one is the fact that trauma often is a surprise to us. You know, we thought we were safe, and then it turned out we weren't. We were horribly unsafe when the trauma happened. So later, when we feel safe, we might think this is just a fake safety, maybe. You know, the skepticism is like, is this really safe, or is this like it was before when I only thought I was safe, and it turned out I wasn't. So people are going to have a reluctance to believe that they're safe and to trust indicators of safety. Now, another thing that can happen is that trauma often then triggers us to be in an exaggerated state of hypervigilance. And um, so we might feel like we're in danger continuously, even though we aren't. Or we might feel like there's something radically wrong with us because of, we blame ourselves for what happened in the trauma, but that's not true. And so in that case, we need some skepticism in order to actually start moving towards healing. We need to be skeptical of some of the things we believe, but that just gets us in the practice of skepticism. And, that's not, and I think skepticism is sometimes like a, a snowball. Once it gets going, it can just get going more and more. Um, a third thing is that in order to avoid being too impacted by trauma, we often try going into a state of denial, like, oh, that didn't happen to me. Um, you know, that's we push something out of our mind. We become skeptical about whether, you know, oh, I don't think that's, you know, really, uh, you know, what happened. Or like when I was a young man, I could still remember all the horrible things that happened in my childhood. But I just decided that that wasn't really me it happened to, that I was a completely new being that had come into consciousness in my body, but I wasn't the person who had lived through my childhood. And that allowed me to feel distance from who I'd been in the childhood, distance from the trauma. But that in itself was a kind of skepticism. Again, it got going as a result of trauma. Um, you know, and you see this, um, you know, when people get practice at denying information, like, you know, like um, the, the ad companies that learned to deny that cigarettes called, caused tobacco, later they became good at denying that, um, that, you know, burning fossil fuels caused climate change. They could use some of the same methods. And so when people get some of these methods of denial going, they can get a life of their own. And pretty soon the person might be skeptical of more and more. And then another thing is, is when we, in order to protect ourselves, when we invent kind of a fake reality that makes us feel safer, we might start seeing holes in that reality. You know, we start saying, hey, the, what we've told ourselves about reality isn't quite true. And that in itself can get skepticism going. Okay. Now, a final thing is that um, the fr there's an interesting connection between the freeze response and losing our sense of knowing things. Um, that um, basically the, the freeze response is something that happens when our sense of coping is completely overwhelmed. A classic case is like when an animal is captured by a predator and neither fight nor flight can work anymore. Um, so the animal freezes and, and that might save it if the animal is lucky <laughs> um, because sometimes then the predators don't watch enough and, and there's an opportunity for the animal to escape. Um, now, Usually that's our, our sense of knowing what to do. Usually it's our sense of knowing something that organizes our motion. But when we don't know what to do, you know, we naturally do freeze. So there's a connection between the freeze response and not knowing anything. 
Now with animals, if the you know the predator backs off for some reason, usually the animal will just shake and come back to its normal kind of functioning. But with humans, the freeze response seems to often play a much more complex role, um, where people only maybe partially freeze and become submissive during traumatic situations, and then they have a hard time coming out of that freeze mode. Anyway, there's a lot more I could say about that, but I, I think it's intriguing, and I just kind of wanted to throw these ideas out there. I did mention in the in the chat that these slides are available if you know you want to come back to these ideas. So, but but talking about how people maybe trauma can lead a person into skepticism is not the main point of my talk, but I did want to get it out there. But anyway, so now let's spend spending a little time contemplating, you know, more about what it's like to get so skeptical that we have very little or even no truth that it feels like we can hang on to. And I would say certainly enough to get your head spinning. <laughs> um, and that is assuming you have a head, which you can't really do if you're going to be a truly radical skeptic. Uh, one thing is if we reject everything we think we know, then we ha no longer have any basis in our minds for rejecting any additional ideas. That is, if nothing is true enough to hold on to and say this is the truth, then everything or every possibility seems to be just as worthy of a claim to truth as anything else. And, and you can see a form of this in people's experiences, for example, in sensory isolation tanks. You know, tanks where, you know, basically people end up not really perceiving anything because it's dark and you don't hear anything and you're just floating in salt water. Um, so if people have no sense of perceiving anything definite, pretty soon they can start perceiving anything at all. Any fantasy can start seeming totally real. One story I heard about this was a guy who spent quite a lot of time in such a tank as part of an experiment. And at the end, he thanked the experimenter for the great dinner they had served as, as part of the experiment. And he was a bit freaked out when the experimenter said, wait a minute, there was no dinner. You win the tank the whole time. <laughs> he had made up the idea of being let out of the tank and having the dinner. And it actually hadn't even happened. His mind had just created that experience, but he couldn't tell because there was nothing solid to compare it with. Now, along similar lines, though not quite as extreme, and a lot of people have relatives like this, but I have a relative who refuses to believe anything that comes through the mainstream media because she just thinks it's all lies. But then she has, of course, no source of truth. And then she ends up believing stuff that she encounters on random corners of the Internet. And she doesn't seem to be able to have any critical thinking at all about these things randomly encountered because, after all, she can't compare it with the mainstream media because she doesn't believe in it. Um, and a lot of us have met people who quit turning to other people in their lives as an accurate check on their perceptions, but then maybe pretty soon they start believing without question whatever the voices were telling them. Um, so one thing about a truly radical skepticism is it can be very difficult to hold that position. Uh, Bertrand Russell, who some of you know is a fa famous philosopher, once said that skepticism while logically impeccable, is psychologically impossible. And there's an element of frivolous insincerity in any philosophy which pretends to accept it. Um, and, and the reason why it's psychologically impossible to be skeptical of all knowledge um, it is because um, our, it's our sense of knowing that governs our movement and, 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 and our choice of which direction to move in. You know, if we drop our sense of knowing anything, it's like the space when, when there's been a revolution in a country, but there's no government has taken over yet. You know, nobody knows what to do. Everything's kind of frozen or paralyzed. Or it can work kind of like in a story that was once told of the guy who got on his horse and rode off in all directions at once. It's kind of hard to get anywhere that way. So anyway, I, I agree with Bertrand Russell about the psychologically impossible part, but regarding the frivolously insincere part, I think it's also worth wondering, isn't there something also frivolously insincere about holding any specific belief when one knows that any, the basis for believing it is something arbitrarily chosen, when one knows that there isn't really a solid foundation for any belief? <laughs> 
Um, and that is definitely one of the problems um, around knowledge and skepticism. Now, one problem in trying to hold a position of skepticism is that a person can become haunted by the idea that certain things might be true, but one might be neglecting to believe in them. Um, this well-known quote by Kierkegaard addresses that dilemma. And he said, there's two ways to be fooled. One is to believe what isn't true, and, and skepticism is a solution for that because we quit believing it. But the other is to refuse to believe what is true. And that's where skepticism causes a problem because we might get skeptical of something that is true and, and not believe it, even though it is. Um, I talked to someone once who told a story of when he was, he was driving on the highway and um, he started thinking that the other vehicles that he was seeing were hallucinations. He became skeptical about their reality and he decided he didn't have to brake for them. Now, some of you might have seen the bumper sticker, I brake for hallucinations. He didn't want to make the mistake that's on that bumper sticker, but then he crashed into one of the vehicles that he thought was a hallucination. And, and, and people do fear having experiences like that, and that fear can lead them to doubt their own skepticism. Uh, you know, of course, after the experience of the collision, he could have decided the experience of a collision was itself a hallucination or a dream or simulation, but he didn't go that far. Um, to get back to philosophy for a minute, you know, um, you know, Socrates is also often quoted as saying, you know, I know that I know nothing, or, or there's a more accurate translation I heard is, but I neither know nor think that I know. But I think the thing the Kierkegaard thing brings up is, can we be sure that we don't know? What if we've been given the correct information, and we actually do know, and we'll get into trouble by not acting on this knowledge that we've been given. Like, what if we fail to recognize that we really do know that we should be putting on the brakes? Um, but at the same time, people wonder, you know, the voices tell them something and they might be skeptical of that. But then another part of them might say, might say, what if that's really true? What if I really have just been told by the voices what's true? And what if I neglect to act on that? Um, so a key takeaway is that people can be afraid of believing in perceptions that may not be true, but they can also be afraid of not believing in them. Um, another way of looking at this dilemma is to consider the tension between these two questions. Um, and, and one of the questions is if we don't open ourselves to messages coming in, how will we be informed? But the opposite is, if we do open ourselves to messages coming in, how will we avoid being influenced by misinformation? Um, and, and this relates to an important point that I want to bring up, that in the states that we call mad or psychotic or whatever, there tends to be not just radical skepticism, but usually also flipping over into a radical lack of skepticism, where people end up believing in stuff that most people would find unbelievable and often not being very open to questioning it. But if we understand how both skepticism and belief can get, pe get people into problems, then we can relate better to why people might flip-flop between them or get stuck in, in a particular extreme. Um, and it, I'd also relate this tension between skepticism and belief um, to what some have called the delusional atmosphere and, and Jasper has described it like this. He said, patients feel uncanny and that there is something suspicious afoot. Everything gets a new meaning. The environment is somehow different, not to a gross degree. Perception is unaltered in itself, but there is some change which envelopes everything with a subtle, pervasive, and strangely uncertain light. A living room which formerly was felt as neutral or friendly now becomes dominated by some indefinable atmosphere. Something seems in the air which the patient cannot account for. A distrustful, uncomfortable, uncanny tension invades him. So, so there can be a sense of something wrong with one's prior picture of the world and a sense that something else, some previously shut out perception of truth, maybe trying to break into awareness. And this state of suspense or uncertainty can be very uncomfortable, or even as Bertrand Russell said, it can feel impossible. So the person typically seeks resolution. And to quote Jaspers again, this 
general delusional atmosphere with its vagueness of content must be unbearable. Patients obviously suffer terribly under it. And to reach some definite idea at last is like being relieved from some enormous burden. The achievements of this bring strength and comfort. And it is brought about only by forming an idea. So the idea that looks to others like a delusion can be understood as a solution for the unbearable state of uncertainty, which, which radical skepticism can create. Now, another way of looking at this is to say that rather than being the primary problem, the emerging delusional perspective or unusual belief might be better interpreted as a secondary response to events and experiences in a person's life, which cause them to call into question their most fundamental assumptions about themselves, their world, and about the meaning of life. Um, it's interesting then to notice the way that beliefs that are formed in this way derive from skepticism at one level, while also showing a complete absence of or denial of skepticism at other levels. So the person, for example, might be completely a skeptical about um, the way their neighbor acts friendly and the way their family and other neighbors confirm that this neighbor is friendly. Um, but then they might have no skepticism at all about the thought or voice that pops into their head that tells them what the, their neighbor is really up to, tells them maybe that the neighbor's planning something terrible. Um, so, so one reason it can be hard to doubt an emerging new perspective about something like the plot the neighbor's attempting is that to, to do so, the person would have to go back to the more extreme state of uncertainty or so-called delusional atmosphere that was so uncomfortable. You know, the, the delusion actually provides a relief from that, that skepticism. So, so what we see it, um, is, is often a delusional belief that both ends up embodying the person's skepticism to some extent. In other words, the person's not believing the neighbor is just a, a neighbor. <laughs> and, and, but it also um, um, gives them an, a sense of, instead of being lost in infinite possibilities about what the neighbor really is, that it pins it down on one particular thing. The neighbor is up to a plot, and this is what the plot is. And so it gives them a sense of knowing what's going on as well. So it, it has some ambivalence in there. Um, so I'd, I'd like to also say something about the skepticism and the breakdown in the sense of self, or the sense of having an I, or what sometimes gets called ipsaity. Um, and normally, we have this sense of self that's kind of hard to pin down. We, we just kind of like sense we know what is ourself, we know it's our own mind, you know, hey, what can you know more than yourself? Um, but when people get into this kind of a radically skeptical mindset, they, they can end up not knowing what in their experience is themselves and what isn't. You know, they no longer have any basis for drawing any line between what is themselves and what is anything else. Um, and this loss of a defined sense of self can lead both to an expanded and to a shrunken sense of self. You know, for example, with no boundaries around what the self is, one can be one with everything. That can include a feeling of being all powerful, a feeling that, hey, I'm making all the decisions in the universe um, and I'm doing everything that's, that's being done. There's nothing that's not I, there's nothing that's not under my control. Um, so that obviously can include a sense of being God or being one with God. And, and lots of people, you know, lots of mystics would argue there's something of value in that perspective. Um, but the other thing is that with nothing that is uniquely me, I can also feel like I'm nothing at all. Um, I'm completely empty and powerless and, and passive. You know, everything just kind of happens and I'm just kind of there, but with no power. Now, so that's the I am nothing kind of thing. And, and it can go back and forth between those. Now, a mystic might be fine with being both everything and nothing. <laughs> um, but the state of not knowing who we are can be incredibly unsettling, especially if we aren't part of a spiritual tradition that gets us ready to have that kind of experience. 
So one way to try to relieve the distress that comes from this loss of self is to grab tightly onto some rigid sense or fixed idea about who we are. But grabbing tight in that way, it's, it's kind of like at the, the opposite extreme of having no boundaries, and it causes a whole new set of problems. For example, if I have a, you know, a really um, fixed idea of myself, like maybe my idea is that I'm someone who believes in peace, I'm a peacemaker, and that's who I am completely, and I'm nothing but a peacemaker. Well, then if a an aggressive impulse or an aggressive thought or emotion or voice enters my mind, I might see it as not myself. It's not coming from me because after all, I know rigidly I'm nothing but a peacemaker. Um, but then where did it come from? And that's where, you know, well, maybe it's a demon or maybe it's the CIA talking through an implant trying to, you know, cause trouble. Um, because if I've, you know, in other words, that very rigidity of thinking that I'm only this makes me think that other stuff in my mind must not be me. So, so I hope you can kind of see how skepticism can play a role in reading, leading us to four potentially problematic states. You know, the I am everything, I am nothing, I am rigidly just this, and that thing in my mind is not me. Um, not to say that there aren't some values in some of these states, but they can also cause a lot of problems, especially if you don't know how to handle them. Um, now, I, I hope you're also noticing how extreme states can easily play off of each other. Um, you know, you can understand one extreme state by often by looking at how it can be a reaction to the opposite extreme or the threat of the opposite extreme. Um, as this slide says, one, one maddening thing about madness is that whatever you can say it is, it's also the opposite. <laughs> So, you know, like in this talk, I'm showing kind of like how madness is often about radical skepticism, but it's also about the radical absence of skepticism, which people go there too. Um, you know, is madness about being fearful? You know, some people are talking about Bertram Karen talking about that. And yeah, I agree. It has often to do with fearfulness and terror. But madness can also be about being in a state where fear is completely absent. The person has no fear of death or anything, and that can be part of madness. And that can lead to its own set of problems. Um, you know, or, you know, is madness about jumping to conclusions or is it about not being able to reach a conclusion? You know, if you see someone jumping to conclusions about what's going on in a situation, you know, you might reflect on how jumping to a conclusion can be seen as a solution for the problem of being unable to reach a conclusion. Again, if you're radically skeptical of everything, on what basis then can you reach any conclusion? You know, there's nothing to guide you. Um, so, so then that could possibly lead to someone wanting to jump to conclusions and, and then to hold on to them without questioning so that they don't end up going back into that place where they can't make up their mind. Um, Often extreme states are just conceptualized as a pathology, but understanding how they're both a solution and a problem helps us tune into the dynamics that people actually fall into, and it gives us clues how to help more effectively. Um, and this understanding of extreme states as both a problem and a solution can, can also help us see a broader role for those states in both um, um, personal and social development or evolution. And this is my adaptation of the renewal model of madness, which has been championed in the past by people like John Ware Perry. Um, the idea is that people start in step one here with ideas and beliefs about themselves in the world, but those ideas or perspectives are experienced as defective in some important ways, like or something causes them to be questioned or to fall apart or be dropped. And that launches the person into step two, which is a transitional state of madness where they may oscillate, oscillate between, you know, radical skepticism, doubting everything, um, you know, no sense of self, no out of their mind, no sense of knowledge, no sense of knowing what to do at all. And then swinging over to the opposite, having fixed ideas, a very closed mind, no flexibility, um, and refusing to question, um, you know, th their ideas at all. 
Now, when, it, when a person's on the radical skepticism side, they experience that loss of a sense of self and loss of a stable, consensual world that's associated with psychosis, or especially um, people have talked about in terms of schizophrenia. Um, this is the ocean that Joseph Campbell said that the mystics swim in while the psychotics drown, is the way he put it. But one thing we know about drowning people is that they try to grab onto stuff, right? <laughs> Anything they see, grab onto it to stay afloat. Um, and it's that trying to grab onto something which, sw which swings people over to that opposite polarity of having unquestioned fixed beliefs. And that's the stuff that gets called delusion. And, you know, one reason people hang on so tight is they're afraid of drowning if they let go. But it's good to understand that. Uh, and people can stay stuck in this kind of oscillation or instability for quite a while, but there are routes out of it. Um, a useful thing about the renewal model is it reminds us that the solution may not be to try to drag or drug the person back to their old way of thinking. Instead, we can possibly help the person into stage three, where they might find a new way of balancing the irreconcilable opposites of skepticism and belief and all the other irreconcilable opposites. Um, and that new way that they find of reconciling things may be more functional than their old way. And it may end up being not just more functional for them, but also for other people around them and for society in general. So, so once we understand this kind of journey might be possible, then the question comes up of, well, how do we go best, best go about helping people accomplish it? Um, and to start, start with, I think we need something different than the conventional approach, which, you know, in conventional mainstream mental health treatment, there's a belief that nothing, can, nothing good can come from madness or psychosis. And, and the mental health providers are trained to be quite firm. There is a reality. We know what it is. You must give up your divergent views in order to be healthy. Um, you know, curiously, this conventional approach involves a professional modeling an approach to their own beliefs that's the opposite of, of what the mad person needs if they're ever going to reconnect with a shared reality. <laughs> because the professional is basically sending out a message that says, hey, I can rely on my version of reality and my sources that confirm it, and I can completely discount your version of reality and your sources of information. I don't even need to talk to you about it. Uh, that's often an exact mirror of the position that the mad person has been taking when they have been rigid about their beliefs and refusing to talk to or, or compare their reality with that of others. Um, so that's, um, so in this conventional approach, the professionals are attempting to crush the resistance of the mad person. Um, but if that succeeds, it leaves the mad person disempowered, likely resentful, and probably soon ready to rebel again. Um, fortunately, of course, and we've been talking about some at this conference, there are newer approaches which encourage the professional instead to come from a place of uncertainty, where the professional doesn't insist they have the truth, or they don't insist that the diagnosed other person has no truth to offer, because after all, we don't really know how much of what we think we know is actually wrong, right? We don't have a certain source of our, our knowledge. Um, instead, what we can advocate for is a process of dialogue and discovery in which various perspectives can be explored and experimented with. Um, and that's what's done, of course, in open dialogue, which is what we've been talking a lot about in this conference. And, but also having that kind of approach to uncertainty is, is practiced within CBT for psychosis, which is something I specialize in. So in defining the role of skepticism in these dialogical approaches, I'm going to borrow from Oscar Wilde. Um, you know, what we want to do is, with, is something like approach everything with skepticism, including skepticism. <laughs> Um, in a healthy uncertainty, we're, we're aware that skepticism can both help us, be, you know, prevent us from being misinformed because it'll allow us to doubt things that maybe aren't true. But we, we're aware that skepticism also can cause us to be fooled by ref getting us to refuse to believe something even when it's true. But from that place of uncertainty, we can approach others, such as those we see as mad, in a much more gentle and, collab gentle and collaborative way.
can be aware that in some respects, we might even be more mad than they are, even though they're the one that got labeled. Um, and we can be aware that we don't have any final source for, of authority for determining what's mad and what's not. And this general and collaborative approach is much more likely to lead to healing and understanding. Um, by the way, some of you might think that what I'm advocating for here is just a moderate sort of skepticism, like a moderate amount of skepticism where the professional sees, well, some skepticism is healthy, but more radical forms of skepticism are unhealthy. Um, but while moderation and skepticism may often be a good thing in many situations, the, the problem is that a more radical skepticism may sometimes be required or absolutely essential when what we were thinking happened to have been more radically off track. And since the professional doesn't have absolute knowledge about reality, the professional also can't really be sure when more moderate versus radical skepticism might be most appropriate. So I'd say again, to follow Oscar Wilde, practicing moderation and skepticism might itself be best done with moderation. Um, so anyway, dialogical approaches. And in those dialogical approaches, we don't try to suppress mad voices or to exclude them from the conversation. Instead, we plan to include them. Um, but we also plan to make sure it's a conversation and, and, and we don't just let the mad voices be the only ones heard. We want to hear all the voices. We, we work on having a meeting which involves different points of view in which no view dominates, but where each one can be informed by the other. You know, we may have irreconcilable polarities, including the polarities of skepticism and belief, but they can meet and talk to each other. And as we model doing this with the mad person and, um, you know, then the, the, the mad person themselves or the person that we've seen as mad may themselves become more willing to relate that way with others and becoming more able to balance assertively sharing their own ideas with being open to hearing and possibly being influenced by the other. And this can also extend to people learning to do this inside themselves with the parts of themselves. Um, so that they can relate to their own emotions and voices and parts in this more balanced way of, you know, being able to hear, but not let anything dominate, um, but hear all the different voices, um, you know, and this is the kind of stuff that, you know, can be practiced in things like relating therapy or voice dialogue, stuff we haven't talked about so much at this conference. Um, but remember when I said that whatever we can say madness is, it's also the opposite. Um, I think we, we get on with our lives best when we learn to live peacefully with these opposites to, to balance them or weave them into our lives. Um, you also might remember the story I told about the guy who got on his horse and rode off in all directions at once. Now we can't literally <laughs> go off in all directions at the same time, at least not without getting stretched out quite a bit. Uh, but we can't allow ourselves to be present with all the opposites, the opposite points of view and the opposite voices and hear from them. Um, I've been very impressed by the Native American tradition where when they have ceremony, they invite all the directions, north, south, east, west, and they're present with all the directions. And this is, I think, the equivalent of open dialogue. We invite all the voices to be present and to be heard. You know, and, and of course, you know, life can't always be just entertaining different points of view. Sometimes we do need to make our, our decisions about what to believe so we can make up our minds, so we can move and take decisive action and accomplish things. And in open dialogue, they recognize that, yeah, people do need to make decisions, but they work on making them kind of a tentative kind of way. Well, let's try this for now, and then we'll talk about, you know, how it's going when we come to the next meeting and maybe reconsider. Um, so this is like where you allow a government to emerge out of a dialogue, but only gently, and then allowing for the possibility of peaceful revolution in the, in the near future, where, you know, we might decide, oh, that direction was completely wrong. Let's try something different. So the door is left open to the skeptical voices and the advocates for other directions to participate fully. They don't get shut out. Um, 
So in life, we really need both a process to make up our minds so we can be firm and make decisive action, but we also need a process to unmake our minds and to, or to get out of our conventional minds so we can be flexible, so we can open up to other possibilities, we can reconsider things. Um, you know, we may need to include the bit about getting out of our minds in order to be sane in a broader and more sustainable way. So, so I think we need mental health systems that model this kind of openness and uncertainty. Um, that kind of mental health system will, will help people become more dialogical in their own process and so able to make up their minds, decide who they are and where they're going on a given day and have some firmness about that at times, but, but also to go out of those usual minds so that they can give space to their doubts and alternative perspectives and voices and relate constructively with them. And anyway, my, my big hope is that this presentation and this conference will do its bit to shift our society towards a more inclusive and dialogical approach where both mental health professionals and mad people and their families will become more able to both value our points of view and our beliefs and to be skeptical of them and to consider other ideas. And when we do that more consistently, I think not only will mad people be treated in a much more humane and helpful way, but also the wider society will benefit from a more open-minded engagement with apparently mad viewpoints, with perspectives that are coming from way outside the norm. And that's especially important given that, as my friend David Oakes likes to point out, normal people are currently destroying the planet. You know, lots of us do need to become more skeptical about how much we think is true about, you know, normal ideas about how to live our lives is actually pretty wrong. <laughs> and we, we need to, you know, if we're going to find a way of living that's truly health and healthy and sustainable, we need to get out of what we have been doing and find something really different. Anyway, um, thanks for your consideration of all these issues. And, and now I think we're going to have time for some question and answer. And if I don't get all your questions answered during this, you can always email me later.